<clears throat> All right. So we are live now, just so you know. So you should be able to see. You. Can you see the little red box in the left corner there? Uh, the live, yeah, the counter. Mm -hmm. so we'll wait till there's some viewers <clears throat> on here, and then we'll get going. Hey, everyone. Uh, Ryan Dunford here with TLR. Uh, because this is recorded, obviously, and going to be on Facebook and uh, YouTube. I'm um, just going to introduce myself. My name is Ryan Dunford. I work for Horizon Hobby. Um, I am the product developer that does the 8th scale side for TLR. Uh, but we're going to wait for some folks to get on here, and then uh, we'll get going. Hey, Bob. Hey, guys. Um, Jeff, no, there's not a kit that contains all the elite parts. Yeah, that is true. The only way to get all the elite parts is to buy the elite <laughs> kit, guys. Um, mm -hmm. And then you just have a practice buggy and a race buggy. I mean, hey, finally can't worked go, for me. Can't go wrong with that. I, fi I finally have a test car and a race car, although I raced both of them. I don't know. <laughs> what I need is another engine to put in my test car. Then oh. I'll have a test car and two race cars. No, <laughs> You'd have your hands full. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. <clears throat> All right, guys. Um, so we are here today to build the TLR 8X Delete Bag E. Uh, it is the rear clip. Um, my name is Ryan Dunford again. I work for TLR. I help with the 8 scale program there. And I have guest uh, Jose Alvarado with me. Um, he is our Southern California, sort of California, who knows, we haven't really set up regions yet, but our <laughs> brand ambassador for TLR, um, and uh, he primarily does nitro, but is dabbling some in electric or in 10 scale finally, which is kind Trying of Trying to. Uh, but why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself a little bit, tell us what you enjoy the most, which part of the <clears throat> hobby you enjoy the most. Um, where your back, what your background is in, what you do for work, that kind of stuff. And I'm going to open this up. Sounds good. So, uh, as, uh, Ryan said, I'm Jose Alvarado. Uh, I, uh, I'm in the Southern California area. Uh, most of, uh, the past, uh, since 2010, I've been racing, uh, eight scale nitro, uh, buggy and truggy. And I just kind of been, you know, just going to every different track as as much as possible doing uh all the J Burrell events and you know like whatever Jimmy Babcock does like uh Sidewinder and and all those events that he used to do. Um I know uh I've been trying to do 10 scale. Uh it's a lot more complicated than I thought. <laughs> so at least at least before all this fun jazz started. Yeah, yeah. So so uh I know tire game is a huge thing when it comes to uh, 10 scale, which in eight scale, you don't really have to worry about it. As long as you have new tires, you're good to go. So, um, <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so I'm just trying to, uh, you know, kind of play with that. And um, it's pretty fun though. Like it's, it's definitely different. So I'm, I'm, I'm definitely uh, looking forward to that challenge and see if I can, uh, you know, just meet more people and get a chance to, you know, hang out with, with, uh, everybody. So, um, I've been racing since 2010, uh, back in ARC, uh, raceway when it used to be at a uh, Vail Lake, um, kind of started off with the ready to run associated because I worked at, uh, hobby, uh, hobby people. So kind of, Got started off with that and uh, raced about six months with that car. I couldn't do anything. Um, I had no idea how to tune an engine, had <laughs> no idea how to tune suspension, which I kind of still don't, but I'm, I'm working on it. <laughs> so uh, just- uh, I think we been... all always are. Yeah, you know what though? Like in, there. For, in the last three years, I don't think I've, you know, learned as much as I have now, like just hanging out with you and Dom V and, and Gil and, and everybody at the races. Like I've learned so much and become in, in, in regards to setups and shocks, you know, tuning and stuff like that, which is, it's helped out me a lot. Um, obviously my, I'm kind of a full send kind of guy. So therefore, uh, my, uh, race, uh, you know, finishes are not that great, but 
I still have a blast. I come down smiling, and I think that's uh, what we all do this for. So, yep, for sure. Um, all right. Well, thank you for introducing yourself, and thank you for being here. Um, we You're like welcome. having Jose around in the pits for sure. Great guy to have around, and um, he's partially responsible for half the folks in Southern California that are on the team today. But um, we're going to go ahead and get started here, guys. Uh, we've waited long enough. Uh, we've done our introductions, and we're about five minutes in. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with this build. Um, like the previous bags, uh, I am going to start with bag E1. Maybe if you can see it. There you mm -hmm. go. Bag E1. I always start with the numbers. Um, you'll see I don't really have a manual here. Um, <clears throat> I've built enough of these now that I I don't really need the manual as long as I build the bags in the right order. <laughs> <laughs> when I just cut everything open, that's when uh, I start to be like, uh, uh, uh. So I'm going to cut all the bags that came in bag E1 open here. And then uh, we will get started building this. Uh, the first part here is uh, building up the rear ring and pinion setup. So like I normally do, I'm going to set all my screws out so that I know what I have, so that I know that I have everything. So first things first, uh, with the rear, because of the type of case we use, you don't have to build the pinion gear inside here. I can actually build the gear right outside of everything. Um, I want to apologize up front, guys. I hurt my hand a little bit yesterday. Um, pulled back my trigger finger a little bit. And uh, so I'm going to do my best to hold everything okay and still show you the right way to do things. But um, so first things first, I'm going to give my thread lock a shake, TLR lock, shake it up. You don't want it to be, you don't want to not shake it because what happens is sometimes it'll separate a tiny bit. And then when you go to squeeze it out, you just get this really, really thin liquid. Um, that's not Threadlock. Threadlock's a little bit thicker. Um, got our motor spray, just like the previous bag. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to start off right here. Spray off. I'm going to clean off this set screw here. Because this is the first thing we're going to do is put our pinion together. I am going to spray out the outdrive coupler and apparently spray half of my uh, computer. <laughs> so it's nice and clean now. Yeah, yeah. As long as it still works. So I got my pinion gear here, guys. Five by 13 are the larger of the two bearings. Hard anodized little spacer, smaller of the two bearings. And then this goes in here. I always line up thumb, finger to the flat. So you can mm -hmm. see in there, I've got the flat. Um, now, again, we do sell the um, HD pinion bearing sets. Uh, so if you wanted to build it with those, you could. That's TLR 347000. And again, like I said in the other one, you do get four bearings. You get two 513s and two 511s. Um, so you can do a whole car with it. But just like before, I kind of make a nice top layer, blow it down in there. I'm going to rotate this once around. And then I've got the top there again. I'm going to put just a tiny bit on the set screw now that I've got it all full <clears throat> in there. Put that in. Go slow, kind of go in and out a little bit so it finds the flat spot. Wipe off the excess that I have. And then I'm going to grab hold of this again <laughs> as best I can. And we're going to tighten it. And again, you're not tightening it like 100 foot-pounds, people. Um, you're tightening it almost as tight as you can get without feeling like you're going to break your wrench. Now... Mm -hmm. People say, well, it's a two millimeter and I'm not going to break. It's plenty big. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people break a two millimeter, especially doing it in the coupler. The important thing about the coupler, it's, it's about getting this set screw tight, but it's about getting the thread lock all in there. And you can even see maybe, no, I can't hold it right. 
you can even see a tiny bit of thread lock made its way down the shaft all the way. So the reason I do that is it fills in any gaps with thread lock. It makes sure that's completely full of thread lock. This bearing's still spinning freely, so we're good to go. That should never fall off. I, I've never had one fall off. Knock on wood, wherever it is. Okay. Now I've had the front one fall off. Right. I yeah. <laughs> I don't know. For some reason, the, the coupler's like one of the biggest parts. People are always like, oh, my coupler fell off. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Got any questions yet? Send it, crew. Yeah, that's that's. Oh, yeah, I got my mandatory uh, haircut from uh, being stuck inside, guys. So, yep. See how bald the top is? Really thin. That's how you can tell I'm old. Um, or wiser. Mm, yeah. So, <laughs> we've got our rear diff, guys. Um, I'm going to build this just like the front. If you guys watch the build of Bag D, you'll notice I don't <clears throat> put grease on this yet. And that's so that I don't get it all over my hands, really. I'll put it on afterward from underneath since we have a window opening. So I'm going to go ahead and get this ready. Um, here's how I always set up the ring and pinion in the rear from the first build. Um, now, I say that because depending on where you run, if it's super, super hot outside or super, super cold outside, plastic can expand and contract. So... While I recommend this to the initial build, it's important that you put it together and you adjust it usually after about half a gallon and just make sure you essentially want the ring. That's new. Never had it do that. Well, okay. That was weird. Sorry, guys. Um, you essentially want the ring as tight as you can get it against the pinion ring gear, pinion gear, without it having a super tight spot. A small, tight one or two teeth, that'll break in in like two bottles, if that. Um, so here's how I always build it. So we give you a bunch of shims. There's thick shims and thin shims, mm -hmm. okay? Thin shims are roughly 0 0.1, 0 0.11, okay? I need three of those for the way I build this. So I'm just going to randomly pick up shims. Okay, I now have three of those. That's 3.1-ish shims. And then I'm going to reach around. And some of these are much, much harder, much harder to bend. Mm -hmm. There we go. There's a nice thick one. There you go, 0. 0.25. Okay, that's what I use. I use 3.30 shims and 1.25 shim when I build a fresh rear case. Now, some people will try to put it all in and shim it all up while it's sitting open like this. None of it matters until you bolt all this together and bolt it to the chassis, guys. So here's what I do. So this is the left-hand side of the car. When you're looking at it from the rear, left-hand side. Or in the United States, the driver's side. Um, I say yeah, it that 40. way because I had Andrew on the other day. <laughs> So I had to explain it in terms of uh, both because I've driven in Australia, right hand drive, and it's a unique experience for us folks. Mm. Uh, but as you can see, this is the rear diff. It's got 4K oil in there, um, marked as such. So now I have my 0.25 on the left. I'm going to put the shim in place. And this here is, <laughs> I see this all the time. Okay, and here's the easiest way to tell. So I'm going to start with the right-hand side. The right-hand side, diff spacer, can only go on one way. You can't exactly put it on this way. I mean, I guess you could, but it doesn't do anything. <laughs> but you put it on this way, the flat torques. So I'm going to put 3.1 shims on this side, all stacked up. And then I'm going to put this on. Bam, there we go. Not too difficult. So I put my 0.25 on the left side. Guys, I can't tell you how many people have come and said, I keep stri stripping rear ring and pinion gears, right? Mm -hmm. It's because they put this on this way. Okay. Now, if I look at this side and I look at this side, I can tell the two are different because this side goes down and cones in just like this does. So just so you guys know, see the little X marking? X goes in. 
okay so when you put it on now if you look at this the flange and the flange are about the same distance away from these notches which are in the rear out drives mm -hmm. okay <clears throat> that's all there is to it now the hardest part about building our rear diff is okay. this goes into this spot and this completes the rear gearbox essentially mm -hmm. So all you want to do is get that nice and lined up. Which I push down, I push the two things together. I guess Bob is saying that uh, his video is stuttering. Is anyone else's vid feed stuttering or is it just my internet? <clears throat> Hmm. I know I saw yours uh, kind of stutter yeah. a little bit. Well, everything on my side like went to a little whirly mill. Oh, really? And Cause... I'm the host, so I would assume for a second it all kind of. So oh. we'll keep going. If it still does it, folks, let let me know. So and as long as Jim Conquest is good, I know he needs this, even though this is his car that I'm building. Again, thank you, Jim. Um, so now I got that in there. I just drop my pinion gear in there, clip over the top with my left hand because my right hand sucks right now. I'm gonna put this on nine and then I'm gonna move this to low, guys. Mm -hmm. So if you are using a Hitachi, it's on nine, this is on low. Grab my 2.5 and I'm gonna run in the three bigger ones first, okay? One. Ah, so how has everything been going for you, Jose? Uh, just staying busy. Uh, still working. Uh, yeah, you I'm are still working, right? Um, I'm essential. Um, <laughs> you are. Uh, <laughs> Wait, but, what does uh, that mean again? Uh, you know what? I have no idea. All I know is I have to go work and I don't get any extra pay for risking myself, you know? So, but right yeah but um yeah no still still staying busy been doing a lot of chores around the house you know something i've never really got a chance to do because i was racing so much so right but no it's uh it's been okay i'm really having withdrawals now <laughs> yeah. well this is why my hands hurt building a track so i ran those in at nine on my drill guys and this is a fresh case so I'm just going to go in and make sure they all snugged in all the way. Basically, once you see the seam is closed, you're pretty good. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's those. I'll pull this out. We're going to put this in. I'm going to turn my drill down to five now. Okay, to put these little screws in. And it's still on low. These don't need to go in super fast. And if these strip, then... Well, it sucks, quite mm -hmm. frankly. So you'd have to replace the case, right? Yep. Yeah, you don't want to run if these screws are stripped, guys. All you're gonna do instead of a whatever it is, ten or fifteen dollar case, um, you're gonna blow apart a ring and pinion, and that sucks. So. Mm -hmm. All right. So those are all in there. We're again. We're gonna check them. We're not trying to grill or tighten any of these. We're just making sure they're snug. Okay. Guys. Sounds good. See? Good to go. Barely any play anywhere. Okay. Again, mm -hmm. this is what I use when I first put it together. Now, after about a gallon of gas, what I will do is I will come back. I'll set my car on the bench. I'll pull off the rear links. And I'll take my rear diff and see if it now moves right and left and has some right and left movement. Because usually that's what happens. Once it all breaks in, all this plastic heats up and it, it, it gets pushed around a bit when your suspension's going through its travel. The diff does. So it's going to tend to push the case out as you're going along. So what you want to do is if you come back and you can kind of take and you can click the rear diff back and forth, um, you just want to add a little shimming until it's 
you, know, you don't want it to be super snug because then you're putting a side load on the bearings and it's not spinning. This you can see, I don't have any side load. I mean, that's spinning. Mm -hmm. Good side load, good mesh. So I got that. Um, there's a there's a question here. It says, uh, ever put grease between cases to seal them up? I do not. Um, when we first got the car, I did used to put grease around the bottom here mm -hmm. and then put it down. Um, now we sell or the 8X Elite comes with the gasket mm -hmm. that now seals the case. So I, since we've had the gasket, I've never seen any um, dirt or dust inside our gearboxes since. Yeah. So... So now I'm going to go right back to, I'm in this case, I'm going to go to 10 because these screws are really long and you all know by now the clutch in my Hitachi isn't the best anymore. A little too I much would, use. If it was new, <laughs> I'd probably use nine. No, this one's just always kind of suck. Huh? I'm going to run that one in a little bit just to hold it in place. And that's really so I don't have to spend all my energy to hold on to this. I'm just going to run this other one in here. Okay. Right till it stops. Hey, Justin, you know, he's, he's going to put a grease uh, on in between the pinion and gear right after the, he assembles so he doesn't get any grease on his hands. That's how he does yeah, it. Yeah, guys. Um, and I mentioned this earlier, but we can mention it again since uh, Justin mm -hmm. brought it up and Hold on. <laughs> there we go. Sorry, I forgot my mouse. Um, that's helpful. So Justin here, um, no grease on ring and pinion gears. Uh, yes, the ring and pinion definitely get grease. Mm -hmm. um, but because we've got an open bottom, I tend to like hold and press and different things. And what happens I find is if I put the grease in, um, I end up with it all over my hands and half of it off the ring and pinion. So what I do is as soon as I finish the rear clip, I actually put the grease in from the bottom window here. Um, so that's the reason I didn't put in, in. I don't know if I can zoom the table cam. I'm sorry. Here you go. I can move stuff up. Um, but I do understand wanting to zoom it some. Sorry, guys. If uh, here, watch this. Let me go to this view. You guys can see this camera is like at the top of my head right now. So it's, it's as close as I can get it. <laughs> so I'm sorry. I'm trying. Um, so literally there's that. So I got some extra shims. Keep these, right? I get a bunch of extra shims. Keep these shims, guys. Um, obviously, you'll use them for later if you need to. Or if not, just have, it's handy to have some extra shims. Right? So that was bag E1. Okay, I used up everything. There's no extra bits and pieces sitting here except for the extra shims. So I know I did everything I needed to do. So now I'm moving on to bag E2. Uh, someone's, someone's asking if you post these videos on YouTube. His son is about to start building his 8X Elite soon. Uh, yes. Uh, all these videos are posted not only to our Facebook page, to TLR Facebook page, but they are also posted to YouTube. Um, and as soon as I finish the build completely, what I will do is I will go in and create like a, uh, a playlist for it. And then we'll go from there. So just like I did with E1, all the little itty bitty bags for E2 here, I'm going to go ahead and cut open because the the little bags again the little bags inside here guys the reason there's so many little bags is like this keeps all the oily steel parts away from this bag that i just opened which is nice parts bearings away from the drive shafts right so you're not hitting things and marring stuff you're not mixing greases and oils as things ship around all that fun stuff so that's why you have the sub bags. Plus it makes it easier for our vendors to do QC and makes it easier for us to do QC because we weigh everything. Um, and that's just kind of how all that goes. So let me move all this over here. Um, 
again, I, I don't know why I do this. I've always done this, but I'm going to do it. So let me go through and lay out all my screws. You have OCD like Bob Taylor. <laughs> well, it's just one of those things. Like, I don't want to. Usually they kind of go in in pairs, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, well, if I have got them all and all of a sudden I'm putting a bunch of stuff in and whoops. Nope. Um, I don't know, just one of those things. I just want to make sure I have everything. And that way when I'm building, I can just grab both the screws I need really easily and go from there. Okay. So there's everything ready to go for this first step. I need rear hubs. I think that's the next step in the manual, but um, for me, this is always the next step because I don't want to lose little parts. Um, so I'm going to build up the drive shafts. And these are what we call our DCVAs that come in the back of the 8X Elite, guys. Um, that would be, it stands for deep yoke. And what that means is, Here's the axle, right? If you compare this axle to our original CVA, you'd see where the pin is. It's much further this way or not as deep into this setup, right? So uh, the other thing to know, note about these, <clears throat> we'll see if I can show this. You've got six sets of holes. And as you spin it, <clears throat> the holes get further in or mm -hmm. further what would be towards the wheel or further away from the gearbox. The way we number these is the furthest hole that's closest to this outside edge. That's number one, number two, number three, as far as the way you see it on the setup sheet. As it's further out, it tends to provide more exit side bite or exit lateral traction so as you're getting on the throttle coming out of a turn it makes it so the it the rear end wants to plant and kind of go forward as you get deeper in it's less support and what that allows the car to do is to have it the car continue to rotate as you're getting on the gas exiting a corner guys um so and it gives you so as you it's a, as it's deeper it's a little bit more entry a little bit less exit and as it's further towards the gearbox it's more exit and less entry grip or side lateral grip so uh, this is something so for me the way i drive is i like to come in hit the brakes rotate the car or whether i'm rotating the car on the brakes i'm usually hitting the brakes going straight and then i'll turn and the second i'm like halfway through i'm wanting to pick up the throttle and exit the turn and so i want the exit so since i'm sliding the car straight on the brakes i don't need the entry grip mm -hmm. but i want to and then i let it settle rotate the car or turn the car and then i give it gas exiting the corner so for me i always run these in the number one hole mostly if it's higher grip, uh, I'll usually change that to at least the number two hole. So I typically slide my car in um, into the turn and then use a brake to slide it more and then press the gas to get out of the turn. I still right. run it on the one hole. So you're saying yeah. that for me, my type of driving. You might like the number two hole. So okay, I'll, something I'll, we're trying. But I'll I'm going to build this in the number one since I'm building it. Uh, and then Jim can adjust accordingly. So <laughs> the way I build these is the inner bearing captures that pin. So instead of worrying about that pin kind of go everywhere, I take it and I stick the bearing right on there just to hold the pin in place, guys. Mm -hmm. So you can see now the pin can't go anywhere. Um, but basically the way you build it, I put it in, I line it up, and then I look at the holes, I find the hole I want, And then that goes in place. Now, one thing you'll notice is I didn't grease them. The more this locks up, the more grip you get. So hmm. these aren't greased, but it doesn't go through the bumps quite as well. So it's always a balance, right? 
Plus, you always want to make sure your drive shafts break in. I mean, these, you put them in brand new, they might feel better. They might feel worse than what you have in there because they're not broken in. Uh, so to expedite breaking in, you can dremel these pin faces a little bit. I dremel all the way around my pin um, if you want. But, or you can run it bottle, bottle and a half of fuel. So What's the part number for the deep yokes? I do not have that uh, at my purview at the moment, um, but I, I'll check that. Uh, so now I have that in place. I'll stick my outer... Man, I am clumsy today, guys. It's because I can't grab anything right. So I'll stick my outside bearings in. Okay. And I'll use that as a guide. And then I just press it in as best I can. That hex goes on. And we do include the plus one hexes for the rear of the car with the Elite. And then that goes in there. Now... That pin should slide in fairly free. If it doesn't, it means that there's too much pressure on your bearings and you didn't get the bearings press fit all the way in there. Mm -hmm. And then same thing here, uh, a little bit more motor spray. Doesn't take a lot, guys. And then I'm going to clean off this because I'm going to put a tiny, tiny bit of thread lock. And again, it's not really necessary on this car because the pins are captured. Um, but it's just, it's a good habit to get into because you will, you will have some cars that that pin isn't captured on, like maybe a future car that we have. I've and seen people, will, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I've seen no, people break their pin, do. uh, a lot. So that means that they're over tightening it. Yeah. Guys, you're not trying to gorilla that pin. That pin is literally all it's doing is holding this hex in place. So as long as you keep that. And all in this instance that that pin is for is keeping this hex in place and so it doesn't rotate on there. But all the set screw is for is for when you take the tire on and off. So literally, as long as you've got enough pressure that this pin doesn't just slide out when you pull the wheel off, it's enough pressure. You do not have to grill it. It's, it's You're bowing the pin a little bit. That bowing moment is going to hold everything in place. So... Okay. So I got the part number for the deep yoke, which is TLR 24, 20, 35. Okay. And that's the full set, right? That's the full set. Yes. Okay. okay. Clean that off. A little bit of thread lock. And again, it's just a little bit guys. I mean, you can see, you barely see it on the camera there. Whoops. Huh. Don't even put that in there yet. Okay. <laughs> There's that and see how nice and easy that pin set in there. It's this isn't. Whoops, sorry, didn't mean to bump the camera. It is right on my left arm here, so. Um, and again, I know people are cringing me grabbing these with pliers, but I wasn't going to say a thing. Special pair of pliers that really grab the hex well, and you'll see there's nothing really going on there. Um, uh, build tip. Um, I normally use the AKA wheel wrench because it has a hole through it. Um, yeah, the wheel wrench I have here is the older TLR wrench, and there's mm -hmm. no hole there. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's why I don't use that. The other good one to use is a is just grab a wheel, mm -hmm. so grab the wheel out of your kit, slide the wheel over, and tighten with that. Um, somebody just asked, uh, let me answer this here. Um, Vinny asked, what does the plus one and plus two help, help with? First, let me explain what they are. So there's a standard hex, which is a given width. Plus one. So mm -hmm. you can sort of see it. Plus one come in the rear. So plus one just means it's an additional one millimeter depth. Plus two is plus two millimeters of depth. Um, what they, in the rear, a wider hex will give the car um, a little bit more of a tendency to not want to like uh, necessarily roll over when you have more grip um, or when you're going through bumps and whatnot. Um, a narrower hex will tend to, and, and provide more forward bite. 
A narrower hex will tend to give you a little bit more lateral grip or side bite. Mm -hmm. um, our car in the rear, you can go up to a plus two with it being legal width. Um, in the front, you can only go up to either standard or plus one. So if you go up to plus two, it's not legal. Um, but that's what that's what that means. Um, so there's those. Um, so just so I don't screw you guys up, we're going to look in the old manual here and see. E. So far, we did follow it accurately. I put all that together. <laughs> okay, so the next step. Let's see if I can keep this open somehow. All right, the next step is fun. So here's what you get for rear arms, guys. Um, in the Elite kit, you get um, what we call composite or plastic arm inserts. You can run our arms three different ways. You can run them with no insert, plastic insert, or car composite, or the carbon fiber insert. Uh, the Elite comes with both. Um, the reason the Elite build has the plastic or composite inserts here is because that's what most of us run. Most of us run the carbon front, which is how you build the front, and the composite rear. And so that's how it has it built. Uh, in the option bag, you get the other two. So you get the composite front and you get the carbon fiber rear and the necessary screws to go with them. But one thing I want to point out is like, see this arm? This is how it came out of the bag. That just happened to fall in there. This is the right side up. See how you've got the indents for the flathead screw to fit in there? So for what it's worth, this isn't wrong or anything. It's just, it's in the wrong arm and got in there upside down. So <laughs> I didn't pull it out. I was going to pull it out. I'm like, ah, I'll show you guys. So, and then you want to get these off by using some side nips, something that doesn't leave any thing there. Um, and then you need all these little washers. So you want to cut all those off too. Very exciting stuff here. Unlike the front arms, on these you do cut the, the little. <laughs> yes, on this you do cut it off. On the front you leave it there, as I mentioned in there, but it's always good to mention again. Oh yeah. All right, so there's that. So the first thing I'm going to do is left, right. Um, first thing I'm going to do is put the inserts in. And I do this on one on high because I'm impatient and otherwise it takes way too long. <laughs> so while I'm doing this, Jose, you got any interesting stories? Tell us the first Oof. thing you want to do when you get out of your house. Uh, honestly? Yeah. Taco Tuesday? I've, I'm Mexican. I do that all the time. <laughs> I know, but you can't do it right now. I can't find any Taco Tuesday to go to. No. Uh, I have a Mexican restaurant right, like, not even a mile from my house that they still, you can still pick up food. Oh, they have okay. the Best carne asada fries I've ever had. Um, so I, I do that a lot. And I'm gonna, later tonight, I'm going to barbecue some nice uh, steaks. So, um, well, but the first thing gonna, I want... You're going to come over here and barbecue some nice steaks? Is, is that what I heard? That is exactly what you heard. Um, I'll take uh, my I, car I, too. <laughs> I, got, I got pork chops to barbecue tonight. Pork so. chops taste really good barbecued. Yep. We're doing, doing pork chops and ranch beans. Yeah. That's something I learned from my second mom growing up, Doug Nielsen's mom. She's awesome. So, Miss Jane beans. Nielsen. She is. She is my second mom, or was. Now I'm married, so I have a new, new second. That's kind of mean to say. I have another mom. We'll not rank them. How about that? Yeah, numbers are bad when it comes to uh, uh, numbering they're, they're uh, not, women. That, <laughs> numbers don't mean any ranks. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but uh, now nah, I just I have fuel, I have the car ready, I have uh, truggy ready. I uh, just need to order tires so I can, as soon as we're allowed to, I can go out there and uh, send it uh, some more because I'm, like I said, I'm having withdrawals now. So, yeah, 
Yeah, I ran about a half a tank last night. It was dark and really hard to see. That's when I finished. So, <laughs> but you anyway. But you ran though, so that's cool. <laughs> so guys, this is how we put in the droop screws. I put the drill through it, and then I press down on the table because it's broached on here and here. But I don't have a three millimeter speed tip, so I just use the two millimeter side, and then I just run it in and out a couple times till it really doesn't change sounds much. And that just kind of heats it up a little bit and seats the threads. Um, and that way it's, I mean, your droop setting's not going to change very easily, so. I don't, I don't know if this helps. What's that? I don't know if this helps, but at Harbor Freight, I found a tap, um, the right size for the droop hole. So I, I normally tap mine before I put the screw in there, so. Oh, that works. All right. Uh, let's see. What's the next step? The next step is to put the rear hub on. Okay. So right now I have my right and my left. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take these hinge pins in the rear. And I just kind of go finger tight until I hit the thread lock or the th locking insert that's in these nuts to get my. And so when you build the hubs, there's no right and left. They're the same thing. So you literally can set them on here. Now with these drive shafts, I've found that the further back the hub is, the more grip on exit you're gonna have. Um, but the way we build it in the manual, um, I, I'm for Jim, I'm gonna build it, I'm gonna put two shims in front and I'm gonna put it, so there's two holes here, guys. This is, this is the, the top hole is the A hole and the bottom hole is the b-hole. <laughs> Try to say that as straight-faced as possible. I'm going to put it in the top hole or the a-hole, which is the hub the lowest it can be. Um, that also provides the most rotational grip for the car. Um, so, and the, the if you run it up, changes the roll center and provides a little bit more uh, forward grip coming out. So, um, you're somebody that likes to straighten up very good and then go, well, then you should be pretty good. And now I'm going to use, we make this. Mm -hmm. It's a little TLR 5.5. Okay. It's, it, I don't even remember. It was for adjusting a slipper on one of our 10 scale cars. And I hold one side with it and I use this for the other. Now the car comes with a four way wrench, which you can use. Um, but basically what I'm doing now is I'm tightening both screws or both nuts. I mean, so that's the right arm. This is the front of the car and this is the back of the car. I put two millimeters in front, one millimeter behind. And I just started running my hubs all the way forward. Yeah. And it's different depending on which drive shafts you run. Mm -hmm. I think it changes things because different drive shafts bind differently. So, when I run universals in the back, I tend to run uh, the hub more forward uh, because it binds it up more and gives me more grip overall. Mm -hmm. When I run a CVA, um, they already bind quite a bit on their own. So it's actually about almost straightening them out some. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a question here. Uh, what advantages do you get with the carbon fiber rear shock tower? Have you tried that yet, Jose? Do you want to answer that or shall I? Uh, honestly, I haven't tried a rear shock, uh, carbon fiber shock tower yet. Okay. Well then I can answer. Um, so the carbon fiber rear shock tower, um, it flexes a tiny bit more. Uh, the biggest thing I've found with the rear carbon fiber shock tower is it's a little bit lighter. So you got a little bit less swing weight. It flexes a little bit more, so it feels like you have a little bit more rear grip. Uh, the biggest thing is the rear end of the car lands really well with it. Um, I'm back to running the aluminum one just because I have that extra hole drilled in it, and it made me nervous with the carbon fiber one. <laughs> so uh, I like mm -hmm. the carbon fiber tower until I changed and to run the hole. So, mm -hmm. uh, but both of them work well. Uh, so what's next here? Um, was there another question? 
Uh, the deep yolks work with the XE micro. Yes, the deep yolks, it's the same clip front and rear. So yeah, the, the deep yolks will work just fine. Uh, and then Arce Mendoza, that's all you. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, there's uh, no tutorials in Spanish yet, but could happen. I could, could start happen. making these. I, I can make Jose do this. <laughs> or excuse me, I can ask Jose to do this. All right, so the next step is putting the top of the rear brace on. I'm going to do this on five guys. And again, my goal is to drive it almost all the way in with this machine and finish everything with my hand. And the reason is because you're threading metric screws into plastic. I mean, you're not, mm -hmm. I, I see people use the impact ones and I can't count the number of times I've seen them also strip screws with the impact ones because the impact, it, it just takes that one last tap and there go all your plastic threads. So, um, on this step is also putting the rear arms on. Now this kit build comes with zero inserts for the front and rear. So that's two degrees of anti-squat and three degrees of toe for this car. This little notch goes down because it sets in the chassis. Um, and you can see, see these fit nice and smooth in here. That's how they should be. Um, this does come with updated rear arms. You can see all of this webbing is filled in now between the two legs here, um, just like the front was. The front's updated here and got a little runner on the outside now. And then this goes here. These all stick in here. And you press a little bit. Now again, this is gonna get low speed and go to 10. And it takes, because the screws are really, really long, guys. And they're four mil screws. So it needs a little bit more grunt. Very exciting. Yeah, yeah I like At that At least noise. I'm using this. Could you imagine a build video where I was using all hand tools? We'd be here for like four hours building. I, I man, I remember the days building with hand tools. Yeah, my first uh, uh, TLR 2.0 buggy and truggy the i bought the euro version buggy i built it by hand Woo. that was not fun yeah my first eight scale was a uh, xb8 their very first one and they mm -hmm. give you all the tools the profi tools which are great tools so mm -hmm. as far as tools go it was awesome but they used like what felt like an extra five or ten millimeters of screw length everywhere and <laughs> All the, uh, so much pain. Um, build like a bag a day. So, all right. So the next thing is putting on the rear tower and the mount. So it's asking for M3 by 16. Now most screws I can eye pretty good, but just so you guys, since I haven't shown you yet, button heads, right? Let's pull this out. A button head is as measured from the head to the bottom of the thread, right? Mm -hmm. So that's 15.75. So these are the 16 mil screws. Um, that's also how a cap head is measured. A cap head is measured from the base of the shank to the bottom of the threads. A flat head is actually measured. I'll show you that when I get to the next one from the actual top of the head to the bottom of the screw. Um, so these are 16 mil screws, and then I need the one random 30 mil screw. And so we're gonna put the tower on. Now the tower goes on, this is the back of the car. The tower goes on with the notch that's set up to lock in the shock mount to the rear, right? So I don't wanna accidentally put this tower on this way because then the mounts that come off this side don't lock in place. So you wanna put it on this way with their, that portion backward. And these screws, these two screws, I'm gonna run in on six on high. And again, it's because they're longer. They're 16 mil screws. And these are for the bottom. 
Now, one of the easiest ways to tell, again, I mentioned this with the other, with the front end, that you got the right screws in most of the places in our car, is when you look at it, you can see that screw face is literally used every last bit of that thread. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the next thing it asks me to do is to put on the body mount. So I put this nice long screw through there and this I do on four because even though the screw is really long, there's not a lot of threads there and it is just a body mount. So you put the screw in a little bit and then I'll push backward and get the bottom anchor hole lined up and then I'll finish it off. It could, otherwise it twists on your hand and <laughs> right. So then I line it up and that's plenty tight for that guys. Mm -hmm. Uno mas cerveza por Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> okay. Let me look in here. What's the next step? The next step is the turnbuckles, uh, which I grabbed the shocks, the diff. I didn't grab the turnbuckles. I'll be right back. Okay. So here's the turnbuckles, guys, and I'm going to go over this a little bit again, even though it's in the build video. So you'll see the way these are built is so that when this little notch here is on the left, okay, on the left, because that's how we put together TLR cars, you'll see one has a standard ball. No, you won't if I don't show you. <laughs> and one has the flat ball. Okay, and the reason for that is so that they're opposite, so that both of them have the line to the left-hand side of the car when you build it. And that way, all of your turnbuckles are all adjusted. Forward is tight, backward is loose. Okay, now the way we have these mounted in here is it's the inside third hole or center hole. Okay, that's known as the number three hole for what it's worth. So we'll go in and again, the link, the notches to the left, it's the flat ball, which the flat ball is threaded. And I will come back here and I'll push against it and it's spun. So that didn't work out. So I'm going to grab this and grab this and pliers hurt really bad right now and tighten that up. Now, I built these turnbuckles with these new gray rod ends that we have, guys. Uh, they're a lot freer under load. The type of material doesn't bind as much. Whoop. And um, those come like this. A pack for your whole car. It's TLR 244068. Um, these come into stock this week. So you'll be able to get them this week. Perfect. So then I'm going to check this one. And now I'm going to do the same thing on this side. Daniel was asking if you were going to be using the long, cam the long rear camber mod. Uh, not for building this car because it is showing a kit build, guys. Um, I will try to do a camber mod video at some point here. Um, who knows? Maybe I can mod this car, but it's not too difficult. It just takes time. Um, and I need to wait till this hand heals a little bit more. So as soon as I finish the build series, then I'll show you the camber mod and some different things there. So that's that side. And then this goes into this outer hole here. Mm -hmm. This hole is the D hole, the furthest outside hole. And I do the same thing in the back here. I grab the very tops of these with opened pliers just to get a hold of it and I shove it in there. Okay. Hmm. Never done it that way. Yeah. Otherwise I sit there and I fiddle with it forever and it drives me nuts. Okay. That one's lined up now. And again, we did put the bone in the cup. So bone into the cup. Now, if you forget to, because <laughs> yeah, you, don't have, you don't have the shocks on yet, you can get it on there. 
on there. All right, so now I will turn the whole clip around and finger thread all of these, all four nuts in place at the same time. That way it becomes more of an assembly line to me. Um, I'm gonna tighten these two. These ones should be able to be tightened without holding them in the back because you got these screws nice and tight. Mm -hmm. And again, the other thing I wanna mention is this, the nuts that come with the car are steel nuts. They have a pretty good thread locking function or feature. Um, if you use aluminum nuts, or if you're getting ready for like an hour long main, I would pull all, I always pull all my nuts off and put a tiny bit of thread lock on and then put the nut in place. Um, it's your call, but for what it's worth, that, that would be my recommendation. Anytime I use the, titan the titanium, the aluminum nuts, yeah. I don't have, they don't seem to have as good a thread locking function. And so I always put thread lock on there, but now you'll see that's all in there, right? And everything is nice and free. Let's see if I can show that here a little bit better. I mean, everything, I mean, ow, ow. Just hit my hand, what an idiot. Um, so I am gonna take, now remember, I don't, I, I don't, other than these being even, I don't measure these out per manual because it takes extra time and it's really a pain to get it right. So these I'm going to adjust anyway once they're on the car. But especially now that the thing, the line is on the left, I know that back is longer and forward is shorter. So if I'm looking at the back of the car, so I'm just going to just going to get these kind of close. Um, they don't have to be perfect right now. This isn't, I'm not setting my camber right now, but I also don't want them to be totally off because sometimes when they're off a little bit, then your suspension is not working right and everything. So mm -hmm. there you go. There's half of the rear clip, right? So now, as you can see, again, I used up all of bag uh, E2. So that means now I'm moving on to bag E3, which in all fairness, I, for some reason, I really, really hate doing sway bars. <laughs> I always have I'm trying to get better about it. Sway bars and throttle linkage, two things I uh, love so much. So I, I could do without the throttle linkage. Yeah. So <laughs> anyway, so again, here I go. Don't mind me. I'm just going to get everything all situated here. Oh, that's smaller. So. Iron Jeff says, why does the manual only say hex tool size, uh, 0.05, 1, 2.5, 3 millimeter? They didn't say nut driver size. Um, in the kit, there is a plastic. It's kind of like a tool, but it's plastic, and, it, and you, you can get it built with what's in the kit. So, uh, Did we not put a... No, it's in here. So... In this bag, the mm -hmm. option bag. Sorry, Jim. Oh, there's a metal four-way wrench, so that's why we don't say that you need one. Oh, so even better. That has, whoops, five point five seven. Man, I've been super clumsy today. So you've also got this thing, which is pretty cool. That one's very handy. So this comes with it too, guys, and that's what I should have used, but I just didn't get it out yet. But you've got this, which is a eight millimeter wrench for tightening these guys. So it comes in the kit as well, for what it's worth. Um, so that's why it doesn't say anything about nut drivers. Um, so, yay, sway bars. Um, so sway <laughs> bars are next. So this comes packaged with a 2.6 rear sway bar, um, which is what a lot of us run nowadays. But in the option pack, you get two up and two down. So you get from 2.8 down to now 2.4, which is a new sway bar, just so everybody knows. Um, first thing I do here, well, let me finish with my screws. Sorry, guys. Uh, yep, yep, yep. Yeah. 
Big nuts go with shock mounts. These go with those. I need that. Another big one. Whole bunch of nuts. All right, these are my all of my fun sway bar parts. Now, okay, so now I got everything out here. So the first thing I'm going to do, grab my 050, put it in that hole that's becoming ever smaller to me because I'm getting older. Are you going to start building with a magnifier glass? You never know, man. So I'm <laughs> going to line this up right over the numbers, and I'm going to spin it so that it, I'm not set screwing into the numbers. That way, when I take this off, I still have numbers there. So basically, if you end up seeing any number, then you need to move it over a little bit. And this one, you just, this is just centering it. So there's not a lot of support that you need there. Um, I put that on. Mike, I, I'm, is, okay. So this is gonna go to one again, guys, with a 1.5. I grab my sway bar link holders little plastic you looking things and i always find the part that doesn't have the little notch on it and that's what i put up oh he might want to come run maybe that's why he's calling yeah. <laughs> okay and then see there's flashing on one side and not the other so Yes, I move my lips and my tongue a lot when I'm concentrating. Sorry, everyone. That's why it's important to have the both cameras. <laughs> yeah, right? Please look at the this one. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right, so the next thing I do is I take the longer, uh, these are five millimeter long set screws, and I those go in the middle here. And I again, I'm gonna sit here and I'm gonna wiggle this bar all over the place. Oh, there it goes. See it stuck. I'm going to back off. It dropped. I'm going to go another like little bit, like a 16th of a turn. And now, here we go. We're going to do the other side. Okay, stuck up. Um, a little bit. Okay, moves up and down. Now there's a tiny bit more play on this side, on the left side. So I'm going to give that a little nut snug. Still goes up and down. Plays the same. Still moves up and down freely. See how that's nice and free, guys? Okay. So now, the next part of the build, which some of you have seen in my other posts. So I'm going to do it again, because that's what we do here. Um, these set screws, I didn't show using Loctite on them before. I would use a tinge of Loctite on them um, for these balls because sometimes they can come loose and slide around. But here we go again. So I got my plastic part. It was easier to show on this one for me. So, mm -hmm. okay, so that side, you can see the plastic's uniform. It's the same. If I turn it over... Now you can see there's that shiny ring. That shiny ring is the pin that pushes these off the molds, guys. So that shiny side, or the side that I can see the ring, that's the side I'm going to push in the balls from because that's the way it's going to be the most free. So now you can see it's nice and free in there. <clears throat> Same thing for this side. Just going to push that in. That all moves around well. Same thing here, shiny side. And that's the same thing for everything, guys. It's just how molds are made. So now I'm going to slide these in place. Nothing's really lined up yet, but I'm just getting them both in place. And then I'm going to put these lower screws in first. That's a M3 by 14 which I think is these two, but I'm not 100% sure, so we're gonna measure. And again, this is a button head. 
So I just go like this and I push up oh, 1388. So those are 14s. I said I'd show you guys. So here's a cap head screw. This you measure just like a button head. You go to that flat. There you go. It's an M4 by 16. Here's a flat head screw. Okay, flat head screws are measured all the way to the head, right? So that's an M3 by 30 flat head. Okay. So. Learn something new every day. Okay, so here's this. Now, again, I'm going to go really slow. You want to make sure you hit the center of this holder down here. Oh, it moves around. It's held in place. Okay, I can go the rest of the way now. And again, you don't need to drive it in hard. It's literally just holding the bottom of this thing in place. It's not, there's no load on it whatsoever. Okay, that's in the center. There we go. Now, set screw. I'm going to come from this side. Now, here's what I'd recommend on the buggy. On the rear of our buggy, this, you want the bar to stick about a millimeter out. Instead of it being flush, mm -hmm. right? You want it about a millimeter out. That way it doesn't bind at the top. Okay. That side's good. Again, just a little bit of thread lock. If you get too much, just dump some of it off of there. Doesn't have to be a lot, guys. This is just to keep it in place. You know, these cars vibrate a lot because of the engine in this case. So there we go. So now, see how everything's still nice and free? I mean, nothing's binding. That's how a suspension should be. That's how shocks do the suspension rather than everything else. Mm -hmm. um, how are we doing on questions? Ryan, uh, we're pretty much caught up. Uh, okay. Just uh, one of the questions was, uh, you think the 8X at the price of 369 at Horizon Hobby is still worth the buy? Um, I mean, if you don't have a nitro buggy, and you want to get started on a nitro buggy, I do believe the 8X is for that price is, is a great price. Um, yeah. And then, you know, little by little, you can start to start buying arms and like different little things uh, to get it upgraded to the 8X, which right. is pretty helpful in my opinion. All right. So the next thing it has us do is put the shocks on. Okay. So see how these fit in here? Uh, oh, I already moved them. Okay. So it has you put them in the third hole, the number three hole. It's the middle hole. Um, and you just hold it kind of in place. Make sure it's nice and tight in there. Now, when you're dealing with the shock screws, I told you about this when I did the front, but I'll tell you about it when I'm doing the rear again. Okay. You use two screws. You use a silver one and a black one. Silver one, they're both M3 by 20. The silver one is a left-hand screw. The black one is a normal right-hand screw. Um, now, the rear end, we happen to be looking from the rear, and we always call this the left-hand side of the car. The way these screws work is it's always the, the, the end that you're facing. So in this case, it is the rear end, so this is the left the, the screw that's on my left is what's going to go in. When I did the front, it's facing me. Now the screw that's on my left is what's going to go in as the silver screw. Now that is the right-hand side of the car because it's the opposite corner of the car. So whatever side's facing you is the, the left-hand screw goes on the left of the car. Now... I built these shocks and you can go back to the shock video, but you can see the way these shocks are built. The plastic inserts are facing forward. Both the screws are facing inward. Both the silver lines are pointing out. And both of the bottom screw heads are facing out when the top screws are facing in. 
So I'm going to take this and this one goes in right here. Now you could see I got it in there really easy, guys. It should always be easy. It should never get hard to put in and out. And then I missed because I've got too much stuff here and I can't hold anything with my left hand. Oh. Terrible. Okay, so this, I'm going to go in really slow, guys. Making sure that it's all lined up. Okay, now I'm going to run it in. And again, whoop, that's it. Okay, this you do not need the screw head tight. All right, see that screw head? It's never going to back out of there. I can fit my fingernail under there, right? If I have it like that, that means... If I push this in really, really, really tight, it crushes everything in there, and then it's really hard to get this in and out. So as you can see, okay. See how the shock comes out, guys? I didn't pull, nothing moved. I literally just, no problem. Okay. Now, left-hand side. I'm going to get this started before I set it in there this time. <laughs> okay. Now again, screw hole, screw head out because of the way I built the shocks, screw head out. Now Andrew Ford is saying that he can't understand what I'm saying. <laughs> okay. And again, fingernail right now, this part, Again, all this is meant to face out. Screws go in. So these are just going to push right on there. Push right on there. Nice and tight. Okay. So now you can see the rear, everything. These are facing out, facing out. Screws are in. Everything's lined up, right? Hmm. Yeah. Anyway, did we get haircuts together? <laughs> Maybe. I think Forty's just jealous that we're closer together. So Could be. Maybe you shouldn't. You shouldn't live so far there, Andrew. Sorry, guys. You're gonna watch me do this, so I'm gonna show this to you too. Um. So let me show you the right and the front and the rear clip, basically. Let me pull these shocks off of here so you can see it. So you could see the shocks came right out. Okay, so now the front would be facing me this way, right? And I've got my silver screw. Let me pull these shocks off of here. I just want you to see, because I don't want everybody to be confused about this. It, it, it's one of those weird things that it's not necessarily the left side of the car, right? It's the, it's the left facing you. I'm going to leave these sticking out. Okay, so this is the side of the car that would face me. This is the side of the car that would face me, mm -hmm. right? I've got the left screw, left screw, right screw, right screw facing me. But technically, here's the car, right? So if you look at that, now I've got the black screw and the silver screw. So the screws you always think of is them facing you and then the other going the other way. So I will stick that off to the side there. And I will fix all that later. But I just wanted you guys to see... It's easier to see without everything on there. Whoops. Okay. One rear shock. One more shock, and again, I have the oil weight written right on there. Oops, it's this way. 
so that I can always know what the shock oil is in my shocks. Again, it comes right off with motor spray, electrical cleaner. Heck, if you have got a dirty enough rag that has some oil on it, it'll come right off of there. Um, so there's that. And then the next thing we do is build the wing setup here. Okay, so for the wing, the first thing I do is put the nuts in all these little holes. And the flat goes towards the part that you're going to be screwing into. Are you still putting the cross brace on the on the wing mount or me personally? No, but mm -hmm. this isn't my car and I'm going to build it per manual. Mm -hmm. um, and if you're somebody that is newer and going to crash a little bit, then I would certainly recommend it being there. Um, I don't put it on because, and this is, one of the sections, the manual calls out for cap head screws, but shows button head screws and you get button head screws. So these are button head screws. And this should be lower. This should be on five. Um, so there's a couple of things you can do here. One thing I always do. Okay, I put those in. I back all these screws off a half a turn. Mm -hmm. Um, the reason you do that is it allows the wing to kind of, if you crash, it can flex out of the way and come back rather than if everything's so hard mounted, um, it won't do that. It, it, it'll move and you'll bend the plastic rather than it having kind of flex points. So your, your wing stay will last a lot longer if, if you do that. You don't have to, but it's your call. My wing mount's been on my car for like about eight months. <laughs> Perfect. All right. And so I crash a lot. That. And then. So we got a couple questions here. Um, how do you check if your sway bars are set equal, please? Uh, well, hmm. okay. You do that with the shocks off the car first and foremost, so I will grab the front one since I've got that, right? And for me, uh, I'll usually start usually with it on the car. So right now I kind of got to hold it down. I go and I try to see how much I can lift up each side. So it's hard for you guys to see it from the view I'm at, but basically I'll hold the front and lift it and make sure they both basically come up the same amount before the other side starts moving. And in this case, they both are good. Um, okay. And then we got that. one more. Oh, go ahead. And then yep. let me finish this. Step. So the wing riser is new guys. It comes with the car. It goes like this. It doesn't matter which way you put it, but for what it's worth, these extra two little holes, those are so that if you want, you can put this in place and run, uh, I think it's a 1.5 drill bit in there. And then you just put a couple little two millimeter screws in and it keeps this in place so that every time you pull your wing off, this doesn't fall off. That's what those two little holes are for. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, they were... Uh... Can you explain a wing spacer, please? Um, so. Oh, well, the wing spacer, which we just talked about, mm -hmm. the purpose of raising the wing is to get the wing up into more good air, and it more or less gives you more grip, um, and that's why we did it. Um, so that goes like that. Now this fits right into the wing spacer, and then these really long screws that are actually a tiny bit too long, and they're like that on purpose. So that they grab better. Because the problem with the screws is nobody makes like a 28 millimeter screw, which would be the right length um, for the height that we want. We tried a bunch of different heights. And I go in, I tighten this all the way. 
Now the manual doesn't have you put either of these on here. Um, it's called a gurney flap and there's a narrow I don't know what happened. Yeah, I'm hey, here. Okay. Well, that sucks. I don't know if it's still working or not. Are you watching it on Facebook uh, Live? I am, and... I was still on the live feed and you were not. You were uh, stuck. Yeah, so it's saying that I was still live and you were not. <laughs> I have a confused face. You have a confused face. I have a confused face. My phone, <laughs> the phone is still there. I see, yeah, I see your phone, yeah. So hopefully it's working. I died. Sorry, guys. So your computer, computer got tired of looking at your face. My computer died, but my phone didn't. But the computer was running <laughs> it. So hopefully it's still working. Um, yeah, it says you're still working. Broadcasting. So, okay. Anyway, so let me continue uh, before we were so rudely interrupted. The hardware is in the option bag for these guys. So this is going to get set to the side. Right? Um and now we're going to bolt it to the actual wing, so to the actual rear clip. So we need these two screws and these two screws, okay? And it gets bolted back here. So I always run – gosh, I feel like I should hurry now. That was really weird. <laughs> so that goes in there. So the this the, these lower screws not only hold on the – top of the rear tower but they hold on the bottom of the wing mount guys so i'm going to turn this up to six again run it in a tiny bit and then i'm going to put the other bottom one in just so i can make sure they're lined up okay All right and i didn't run either of those in i'm going to flip it around and put these two in now those are going into nuts into lock nuts guys um and it's fairly short but you mm -hmm. want to make sure these two are tight okay then i turn it around and i go the rest of the way in. and i'm gonna also double check these okay okay and again when you look at this now, these were the screws we just ran in. You can see mm -hmm. the screw is right to the plastic. Screw is right to the plastic. So we got them in there all the way. So now our wing mount's on all the way. And then the last fun part is this. So I always put these nuts in to begin with. And they mostly press in. Um, this rear one is held in place by that being down. And then this nut goes in that side. The only screw you need three millimeters for in the car. Which I don't have a speed tip for because I don't even know if they make one. I'm sure they do for fifth scale or something. They do. And I don't know why I have one in my toolbox, but I do. Okay. And guys, this you want this pretty tight in here. Okay. 
And then this goes in here. The nut goes on this side and is held in place. And the screw goes on this side. So <laughs> Forty was asking if you tried your Hitachi on the screws from below the chassis for the gearbox. If so, did, did they get them in? Uh, well, there's one other spot that I usually have trouble, and it's um, I built a center diff assembly today, and it's running the long screws down. And, yeah, that low setting works great. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> See, I learned stuff too. I love this game. And then these last two screws are for what we lovingly call the mud guards. Mm -hmm. um, if it's not muddy, we usually don't run these guys. Um, and it's just, just because they're extra weight. We don't want any extra weight on our car. Uh, if it is muddy, though, it certainly saves things a lot. And they go on this way. And they literally, they press in and go around everything here. And you run these in on five. But we made them that way. That way they're really easy to put on and take off. Um, and we have a rear clip. You'll notice there's no other stuff here. No screws left over. Everything's good to go. And uh, tomorrow we will do the center diff, which I'm sure a lot of people love to see because I'll show all the brake setup and all that fun stuff. And I might, I'm probably going to combine bag F and G. Oh, yeah, F, F and G. Uh, that <laughs> has another meaning. Um, I didn't want to say anything. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so that's your rear clip. Everything works well. Um yeah, it's all nice, nice looking all together. The one thing I would caution you about is be careful about turning it over because these nuts can fall out. But if you do, just pay attention. And then the very last step, as promised, um, I am going to go in here, hold those two screws in place. Uh, see, I already forgot about that. <laughs> nope. <clears throat> push it. You just push it towards the gear. Right now I do cut a little bit more of the tip of my black grease off um, so that I can get a little bit more of it out at a time, but I just run it around some, you can hear everything's nice and smooth guys. There's nothing grabbing, no weirdness going on. So see now if I would have been wrenching on this, I guarantee I would have grabbed right there. Mm -hmm. Um, for what it's worth, I am going to kind of dab right this place so that when I set it down, it doesn't get any grease anywhere. Um, but yeah, other than that, that's yeah. a rear end. and uh, It's a good looking rear end too. Yeah, right? Um, <laughs> Mike Marshall, I agree with you. For me, yellow wings are faster because I'm getting older and it's harder for me to see. Mm -hmm. Um are there any other questions we kind of missed along the way? Yeah, there's one. Uh, what does not running the cross brace do? Where's that at? That's oh, right. Up. Gareth. Okay. Um, so the biggest thing for me is the cross brace is four 16 millimeter screws and all this plastic up high. And so it has a tendency to make the rear end of the car kind of want to roll over on itself a little bit. So it's just a weight thing. It's just a handling thing. Um, by taking it out, I didn't find that my wing mount lasted any less time. But I don't know. I mean, I'm not on my wing all the time, but I am on my wing plenty. I, I, if you ask Jose, I, I'm sure he would agree. <laughs> um, and... Uh, yeah, it's just a weight thing. It's just taking weight off up high. That's really the goal. Is that's why we keep getting trying lighter and lighter wings for everything. And um, yeah, so whoops. Yeah, uh, v Vinny wants to know if you have to be uh, to be fast. Do you have to be fast to get a sponsor? 
Uh, well, I'm yes not fast. And no. So <laughs> it helps to be fast. Um, for us at TLR, uh, nowadays, the way we find people to sponsor is either our brand ambassadors, such as a Jose, um, or one of our other good TLR drivers has to recommend you. Um, we don't just take applications anymore. You can't just apply for TLR sponsorship anymore. You literally have to be recommended by somebody on the team. And those recommendations come through in, in different ways. Sometimes we get recommendations for folks that are just awesome people. They're already running our stuff. Um, you know, they're going to tracks where we're not taking any business away from like a hobby shop. So, you know, there's some people like that will pick up. Um, of course, if you're super fast and you're out there and you're helping other people and everything, yeah, I mean, we're going to be interested. Um, if you're super fast and you're out there and you're a jerk, we're not going to be interested right off the bat. You, you could go win A mains forever. And if you're a jerk to customers, it, that's not who we're looking for, guys. So that's really how we go about uh, getting sponsored. Um, another Aaron just mentioned the uh, Lexan wing or polycarbonate mm -hmm. wing. Um, I have to call it Lexan. Um, <laughs> patented. Um, the polycarbonate wing does come in the option kit as well. Um, I know Jose's like that from time to time. The biggest reason people like that is, again, it's less weight up high. And a lot of people feel like to them that provides more rear grip. Um, now, what I've seen some people do with our wing is put another set of holes further back and move the whole wing forward. Mm -hmm. um, that can help some too. When I run our wing, I, I put another set of holes in and move it forward. Um, and there's a lot of wings out there that are good. They do different things uh, that different th guys like. But we're going to get done here pretty soon, guys. So if you got any last minute questions, please fire them off. Uh, we'll give it like another 60 seconds here. And if not, we'll close this thing out so uh, people can do their thing. Dan Matthews has a really, really good question. Um, what's the uh, different camera positions for different grip levels? Cause he says he races in the UK and mostly really high grip. So what would be the best camera link settings? Uh, so if I was in the UK, um, first and foremost, my hub would be in the up position. Uh, to, it lets the rear end slide a little bit more. If there's plenty of grip, it's obviously not going to slide, but it lowers the roll center a whole bunch, like a lot. Um, and with that, you can then move the rear link some if you want. Now, I would try it in the number three position because a lot of people really like that still. Mm -hmm. But I would even try the number four or the number five position. That's really what those are for. Um, I definitely would leave this in D. High grip, I'd put the plus two hexes on. Um, I'd probably add some more anti-squat, go up to two and a half or even maybe three. Um, probably stand up my shock a little bit more. It all depends. Mm -hmm. uh, different things. Hey, Dean. Um, at least on the rear end, that's what I'd be looking to do. I'd definitely be putting some holes in the back of the wing. Um, I'd cut these off. Cutting these off allows the rear end to kind of slide a little bit more, takes a little bit more weight off the wing. Um, those are all kind of different things I'd try when it's higher grip. I'd probably go up to 5K rear diff oil. Um, depending on whether I was looking for it to rotate high speed or lower speed. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd probably start moving the hub, play with the hub, like forward and backward wheelbase. Um, future cars, guys, uh, just as a heads up, um, I would show it to you, but I don't have it printed out at the moment. We are going to start including a setup guide again. So from the 8XT forward, uh, the back of the manual will include a setup guide in English, and then the other four languages will be posted online. Um, a little bit more comprehensive setup guide now um, than we have ever included. Uh, the last time we included a setup guide, I think, was the 3.0 .0. Nitro car, mm -hmm. best I can remember. Um, and we, I've always wanted to include them, but sometimes... Quite honestly, we just run out of time. It's like, okay, would you guys rather wait two more weeks to have a setup guide in there to not have the car? Or would you rather 
have the setup guy or not have the setup guy and have the car two weeks earlier. You know, sometimes that's literally the decision we have to make. Um, uh, Iron, show us the 8X Truggy in the next video. I am not allowed to. <laughs> um, I would. Mine is sitting in the garage. Um, I'll be playing with it outside probably in the next day or two. Lucky. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not I'm not allowed to show it. I'm not allowed to talk about it. I'm not allowed to talk about the release. The only thing I can tell you about the 8XT is it'll be out sometime midsummer. Now wherever you're located in the world, that might be different. Um it could be summer now. <laughs> be summer now. It could be summer in November <laughs> for you if you're in Australia. So <laughs> you never know. Uh, yeah. Um, but I do love my job. I love my boss. I love all the people I work for. And uh, no, I'm not saying that because I'm brown nosing. I do appreciate him and his <laughs> efforts. And so I don't want to lose my job. I, I would love to show it to you guys if he said I could. I would. But he didn't. And I'm not going to. Trust me, I tried. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, should have come to DNC. Could have come over and seen it in person. Yeah. Uh, you, you can go to nationals, US nationals. It'll be there next. So um, assuming we have it. Uh, I hope so. Other than that, uh, yeah, Kyle, it, it was really good at DNC, um, and it's actually better now. We've got some new stuff for it and some stuff that's not T1 parts, so should be uh, should be a lot of fun. I can't wait for Nats. Um, yeah. As far as setup sheets go, I do want to also put this tip out there again. I mentioned it at the beginning of the last bag video. I'm going to put it at the end of this bag video, depending on when people are paying more attention. Um as far as kit setups go, guys, always keep in mind, it takes us between 9 and 11 months usually for a kit to go from us writing a manual, meaning putting a kit setup somewhere, to having a car on, out on a box for you to buy. So the reason we always say that, or the reason I'm saying that, is because the best thing you can do, any car you buy out there, any manufacturer's car that you can buy out there is look for the latest setups. We usually try to release setups right as the car comes out so that you can see what we've learned over the last 8, 10, 12 months. Um, so I always have people, oh, I just want to try the kit setup. If you want to try stuff that we knew 10 or 12 months ago, that's your option, of course. But if you want to try what we know now that would usually provide a better handling car from the get-go, I would find somebody's setup that's posted. We post all of our setup on tlracing.com, and it's right underneath each car. You just click on, in this case, the 8X Elite, click on the setups link, goes down to the bottom of the page, and there's a bunch of setups there. Uh, most of the setups that are on the 8X page will also work on the 8X Elite because we were running all the newer parts then. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's our diff spacing I talked about. Yep. Uh, we'll talk about the brake stuff and the clutch stuff tomorrow, or the brake stuff tomorrow. I have the video stuff. Yeah, I think that's everything I meant to mention. Yeah, no. Um, thank smooth. you very much, Jose, for coming on board. Thank you for having me. I appreciate uh, you being around and uh, have to see who we can come up with for tomorrow. And um, mm -hmm. thank you, everybody. And Jose, you hang out for a second. And uh, I appreciate it, guys. Oh, right. wait, Kyle, what setup do you think is the best to start with besides the kit setup, Ryan? Well, my DNC setup's posted. Dakota's DNC setup's posted. Anthony Westergaard's setup is posted under mm -hmm. the 8X kit. Those are probably the three I would recommend taking a look at. Mine and Dakota's mm -hmm. are pretty similar because he had my base on and then has a different shock package. So you could try both pretty easily depending on the base that you put on there. So anyway... I appreciate it, guys. Hopefully you learned a little something, and uh, we'll be back to build more stuff tomorrow. See you, guys.